Good evening. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. I'm Rebecca Lemoyne, the Director of Public Engagement and Learning here. And on behalf of all of my colleagues at QPAC, and particularly on behalf of our special guests from Milan, the La Scala Ballet Company, thanks for being here and part of the student movement. Can I introduce you to Mr. Leo Schofield AM? Uh, last week I introduced him as a bit of an arts legend here in Australia and I haven't thought of a better description since then. Uh, Leo has run most of the major arts festivals in Australia. He's worked with and been on the boards of um, many different companies. He's got a bunch of awards. He is a journalist, a writer, a restaurant critic um, and particularly relevant for tonight, he is a passionate and very knowledgeable um, about ballet, which um, I can't think of a, a better person to give you an introduction into both the La Scala company and the production of Giselle. Equally... Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not a bad cook either. <laughs> and equally, I can't think of anyone better uh, to ask some questions of uh, Leo tonight. Can I introduce you to my colleague, Professor Judith McLean? She is the QPAC Scholar in Residence. She's a Chair in Arts Education, which is a joint appointment between QUT and QPAC. Uh, she, is, she too is a writer, um, a scholar and a teaching artist and uh, is particularly curious, which is what's going to make for a beautiful conversation tonight. So please welcome both of them and enjoy. Thank you. And thank you, Rebecca, for that beautiful introduction. I always feel that's quite a lot to live up to, Leo. We better give them a good show. Oh, it just makes me feel like a jack of all trades, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, so welcome. Can I just check, who was in the audience last week? Okay, a couple of people. We are going to just have a little look back at Leo's um, past again, so forgive that, and then we'll, um, we'll move on to talk about Giselle and the company. So we've got some really beautiful slides and, um, to start off with, and there are you, Leo. Um, I think what's really fascinating about them, you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's fascinating about Leo is when I, when I first knew of Leo, and it was long before I ever met him, I always imagined that he'd had this very toffee upbringing uh, where he'd been surrounded by parents who were steeped in culture and music and that he'd had this very privileged life. And in fact, I was wrong, wasn't I, Leo? Totally, totally wrong. <laughs> I was born in a, a, in a little town called Brewarana, which is just, uh, just below the Queensland border, in fact. If, uh, I know people used to take, drive across the border to go to bachelor and spinster's dinners and dances and things, but it's in uh, far northwestern New South Wales. And uh, what you see there on the screen, I didn't know we had this the other day, so that's great. That is the pub that my grandmother owned. We had rather a monopoly on the three pubs in Brewarrina. as my aunt and uncle owned the second and my parents had the third. So I come from a... a uh, I was grown up with, I grew up with the smell of beer in my nose, I think, and I couldn't touch a beer for many, many years till I went to Germany. But um, I, it was a funny little hard scrabble town. It was 700 people in those days when I was, when I was born, but uh, not many more now. There's only a thousand there, and it's a bit of a, a, bit of a lost cause, uh, as many small country towns are in New South Wales. But um, I. How did you get interested in the arts? How did, How did you... I get interested in the arts? Mm. Oh, that was funny. Uh, I'd never seen a live performance. The first live performance I ever saw was in a galvanised iron shed at uh, the Convent of Mercy in Brewarrina. And uh, my cousin Shirley was performing, and she was a very good tap dancer. And uh, the nuns had agreed that she should be part of the show and that she would tap dance, but to give this to give this exhibition. And, you know, she, she was called Shirley. It's not unnatural because many people were called Shirley after Shirley Temple. You can always tell people's age if they're called Shirley, you know, because they, they were contemporaries of Shirley Temple and their parents admired Miss, Miss Temple. Anyhow, she was a very good tap dancer and she was dancing to the tune of the good ship Lollipop. And, uh, but to make the thing more interesting, she danced and skipped with the skipping rope at the same time. And the skipping rope was covered with these rather crude crepe paper roses. And Shirley was very pretty and she had long black, thick black hair, great big satin bows on it. And she tapped away through that. And I thought at the time, I would have been maybe six, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, a little bit of colour finally in Ruana. Mm -hmm. um, I was sent to boarding school at the age of eight in Sydney and that really was my salvation in two senses because had I stayed in Ruana, I'd
father and I was such an irritating child that he would have killed me to ensure my survival <laughs> in broad terms. Uh, and fortunately, my grandmother had sold the pub in Brewarren and moved on to, uh, on to uh, a house in Haberfield. And my mother's brother, younger brother, who was born after his father had died and after the pub had been sold, and he, he was sent to a very good school in uh, Bathurst. And he grew up learning music and playing the piano quite well and very, uh, became very addicted to music. And at age eight, I was taken along to the Theatre Royal in Sydney to see a performance of a fairly rare now Gilbert Sullivan opera called Ruddy Gore. And um, that was really, I'd had the baptism in the tin shed in Warren, and this, my, this was my confirmation, more or less, in, in the arts. Because I, it was the first time I'd been exposed to the magic of a li of live theatre. And I remember it now, so many years ago, <coughs> With crystal clarity, I can tell you largely who the cast was, I can tell you what the impression of the scenery, the slightly chalky look of the scenery, the theatre with its Wedgwood medallions in gold and red velvet seats. It was a whole new world from the, from the bush. And it was the beginning of a lifelong passion for uh, the arts. I sat on many boards, as I suggest, I produced plays, that's me producing, a, can you see that? Image yes, there? yes, we can see oh, it. Oh, good, I can see I, it here. It's rather disturbing. Was that at university? <laughs> but that's me at the age of about 21 at the University yes. of Sydney. Uh, and you might like just, uh, I mean, oh. I, I love this about you. You might like to just talk about some of your contemporaries at university for those. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we were actually, I was fortunate to be at university uh, at a time when uh, a lot of people didn't care about getting degrees. And uh, we were more interested in running drama societies and producing and acting. And, uh, and that's a production of The Country Wife uh, that I did for Sydney University Players. The, the actual TOFs at the university were in, a, in an organisation called SUDS, the uh, Sydney University Dramatic Society. It was very much a closed shop to us people from the western suburbs and sort of unlikely places like Rockdale. And we, uh, we formed instead a rival group of actors and kids who wanted to act, young people who wanted to act and do things in the theatre. And uh, we called ourselves the Sydney University Players and we actually belted the hell out of uh, SUDS in terms of ambition and the quality of our productions. Uh, we were all amateurs and uh, I began directing and designing plays. That one you see is a, a play by William Witchley, a restoration comedy which I directed for Sydney University Players. It was my, first, my second piece of, no, and, my but, first piece of serious directing. And tell us some of the stars in Oh yes, show. well we went on then to have John Bell and uh, and uh, Richard Werrett and uh, Bruce James. Beresford and Clive James was, uh, he was a very naughty boy on stage, I have to tell you. I could tell you, what's, uh, except there are youngsters in the audience, I can't tell the story, but uh, we had a wonderful group of people. Robert Hughes, the great art critic, was doing architecture, he flunked it. Uh, uh, he painted the scenery for us and whatever. And it was just an, an amazing time. All of us, virtually all of that group, went to London. And, I think that's a photograph of me visiting the great uh, property uh, uh, called Knoll, the home of the Sackvilles. Uh, with, I was exactly, I think I was 23 or 24 then. Yeah. Yes, and so I think this is a wonderful segue um, that really you've spent a life in the arts and you've dedicated your life to the arts and, and Australian culture. And I wanted that to lead us on really to the ballet and to this particularly um, La Scala ballet. Sure. And we talked the other day around the dedication that it takes to be a member of a major company like this. Would you make well, some comments? Uh, I'll start by saying I was lucky enough to be introduced to ballet seriously uh, in 1956 when I saw the American... Uh, the, the great New York City Ballet Company came and did an extensive tour of Australia. They played Brisbane. And uh, that introduced me to it. And I thought it was a particularly wonderful art form. Subsequently, I, I saw the Royal Ballet and many other companies later in London. But I came 
or from a background of really being passionate about opera initially, because that from, from plays I moved to, I thought opera would be the next step. But I've come to understand the, the extraordinary appeal and the beauty of ballet. It's a corny word to use these days. People are not, it's in art circles, you don't talk too much about beauty. But the thing about ballet is that people who perform in it give their bodies up to, to create something quite expressive and beautiful. Uh, it, it, it's a poetic expression of, of, of life and beauty. And the great ballets have survived an extraordinary time, a couple of hundred years, and people can still pack out a theatre for a Giselle, for instance. And the second act of Giselle, Giselle for me is up there with the great moments of, of opera. You know, it, it's, they, they abro approach a kind of sublime level of emotional connection with audiences. And, and that's why they persisted as great masterpieces. La Scala, like Paris, and the two great Russian companies at the Mariinsky and the Bolshoi, are famous for having not only opera houses, but ballet companies that work with them and are trained up often in the same kind of way, we're promising people, much earlier, of course, in ballet, because a lot of young people start at eight, nine, 10. Sylvie Guillaume was at 12, you know, lots of people. So you can imagine the training and, and the skilling of, you have, it's the skill of a great athlete, really, uh, or a gymnast. They, they, their bodies are trained to perform a certain way. Their muscles almost have memories uh, they know what the stop, what step follows the next step, and and it's a a, a fabulous art. Uh, I used to not despise it, but I always thought it was inferior to opera. But I think now it's up there with the great plays and the great the great operas, the great symphonies, and the great ballets are the core of our our, our culture, really. And uh, I am in awe of anybody who gives who chooses ballet as a career. An interesting, um, uh, just really not even on topic, but um, I happen to be involved with a company in Townsville called Dance North. Some of you may know it. And you know that there's a football club in Townsville. Um, I think they're called... The Cowboys, sorry, went from my <laughs> mind. Um, and so Dance North and the Cowboys had a kind of fitness off, if you like. And guess who won? The dancers, absolutely, so t <laughs> to your point. Okay, so Giselle, tell me about why it's so much, so loved, and what is it about what we can expect to see to, tonight in the dress rehearsal? Sure. Well, I think that throughout literature, uh, right through the 19th century, there's a constant figure, and that is the, the damsel in distress. In a sense, it's the, the, Don Quixote sets out on his pursuit to rescue and damsels in distress. And, the, and literature through the 19th century often featured vulnerable female figures. And that story of wronged women or women who have fallen on hard times, the poor but honest woman who is driven into prostitution, they form a great big corpus of literature. And essentially, Giselle's story is of a wronged woman. She is wooed by a, a person who, whom she takes to be her social equal, and she succumbs to his advances. I mean, it's not explicit in that sense, but she falls in love with him very deeply. And he turns out to have cheated on her in a sense, that he's a nobleman, and uh, he uh, is revealed, and she kind of goes mad, or she has a heart attack. I mean, one is uns unsure of the medical condition that she had before she met him, but uh, it, it's, incredibly moving scene, the end, when she learns and, and kind of goes mad on stage. It has its parallels, of course, in Lucia de Lammermoor and Anna Bolena, endless numbers of operas with mad scenes where the heroine goes mad to a high C. And Giselle, to send that, her, her, her condition of madness is expressed in dance, but very, very brilliant choreography and explicit and, and moving. You just really, your heart goes out to her. And uh, in the second act, there is another idea that the, the female vengeance can be uh, wrought on men in a certain way too, because Giselle dies in the heart attack and she joins a whole group of ghostly 
spectral figures called the willies. I often wonder whether when people say, I've had the willies, uh, well, that, that's, they have a, an educated reference back to, to Giselle, I'm not sure of that, but it, it derives from a German word anyway. And, um, but they, they emerge at night and, and go back to their graves at the, uh, at the stroke of midnight. And they're all women who have been deserted or left standing at the altar, something like that. And they're, and they're all in this white, and it becomes one of the enduring images of classical ballet. The Swan Lake image, all this, the beautiful women turned into swans, and in this case, the beautiful women who have all been betrayed, and they, they are now ghosts. But the, the vengeance comes in the form of the queen of this group of people, she's known as Myrta, the queen of the willies, and she decides on the fate of the men who have been uh, untrue to the, to the women, and they should be drowned in a lake. That's the idea. Uh, they should be dragged forth, accused and drowned at the lake. And of course, Giselle's idea is that she appeals to the Queen of the Willies to spare her lover, and she goes back to the grave, and they all disappear, and he is left alone. And, and it's, uh, he gets his comeuppance, as it were. So, but th that's the story. But there are all sorts of layers of meanings in, in, behind it. And it's a role for a female dancer that's the equivalent of Hamlet, in my view, mm. to, to, uh, for a male. Mm. It has so many nuances and, and facets, and many great dancers have danced it. Uh, Italian dancers created the role, and uh, Taglioni and Ceruti and all these great dancers of the Romantic era of ballet, in, in, mainly in Paris, uh, have, have created this figure. And it's persisted because it's, audiences are able to identify with it, not just emotionally with the story, but also with the, the explicit nature of the dance, which contains many, many extraordinarily difficult steps so just as a great actor has to sort of study and interpret and feel Hamlet, so the dancer who takes on the role, the ballerina who takes on the role of, of Giselle, has to uh, understand emotions, feelings, the fact that love persists often beyond the grave. There are many, many nuances. And the great dancers that have brought that, you know, from from the early ballerinas of the 19th century to, to, through to Margot Fontaine and the great Russian dancer Maya Plisetskaya, uh, to the Italian dancers Carlo, Carlo Fracci, and uh, there have been dozens of wonderful women. The Cuban dancer, uh, Alicia Alonso, who's still alive at 100 years of age, I might add, uh, she was blind virtually, and she had to dance all this emotion. And, and she had to have lights in the side of the stage to show her in which direction to dance. But despite that handicap, she was able to be the finest Giselle of her age when she danced with the American Ballet Theatre in the immediate post-war period. She went back to Cuba to head up the National Ballet of Cuba. But every, every company and every, every decade has produced new interpreters of this role and the, in this ballet, just as they have for Hamlet. We've seen everybody play Hamlet. Laurence Olivier, Peter O'Toole, Benedict Cumberbatch. Everyone has a shot at it. And every great ballerina similarly has a shot at this. And I just hope you can feel the extraordinary beauty of it. I think the second act is probably one of the key cornerstones of ballet. The first act is narrative and pretty, and they're pretty prancing pe peasants. And it's, it's been a wonderful line of dancers. It, although it was created by Peter for Paris, it's had some wonderful dancers, Italian dancers, who've danced the role. And there's that line through the Parisian dancers of the 19th century to a, a wonderful dancer called Yvette Chauvere, who has restaged this. She was a Paris opera ballerina. She moved to, the, to La Scala to create the, the, the staging for, for it or the interpretation for this company. And it's, it's served so well. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of almost a fail-safe thing, but there are degrees of brilliance. But I think you'll see a very brilliant company yeah. dance it tonight. Absolutely. Um, I, I, as you were speaking... I don't have to sell it. You've all got tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you were I did a good job of selling you it. You did. <laughs> uh, as you were speaking, I was reminded really of, uh, you know, the whole psychological movement. And, of course. And really, this, is, this work is the precursor to Freud and Charcot and people uh, like that. Absolutely. Who started to think, um, uh, what is this women's hysteria about? 
And it's in fact, that's a link back to, um, uh, Freud is a link back to Don Quixote as well. Exactly. And I noted in my research that Freud uh, actually called his dog after Cervantes' dog. Um, so, you know, all of the, the sort of generational um, wisdom that just layers upon layers uh, happens in literature, in dance, and we see the history of that um, with this company, don't we? We do. Um, we do. And, and, and I'd like to ask you to just talk a little bit about that. We've been fortunate, um, thanks to you and Ian, um, Leo, to see some really amazing uh, ballet through the international series. And within that, we've started to be able to recognise styles of com countries and companies. And I wonder if you could talk about the style of uh, Teatro La Sala. I can. Um, the key styles of, uh, of ballet, there are individual styles to, applying mainly to the older companies. In Paris, the style is, was really created by Marius Petipa, but then later interpreted and refined by other choreographers. Uh, in Russia, they decided the in, during the imperial period that they needed uh, to have that look of Paris, so they brought Mar Petipa to Russia. And the brilliance of that was that he was exposed to the greatest of all ballet uh, composers, Tchaikovsky. And so the Russian style evolved with a more, a uh, higher degree of narrative ballet. Declaratory kind absolutely, of, like absolutely. Ballet. There was a little sideline in that, and one of those dancers went to Denmark to create the Danish school, and that is a completely different style of dancing. They don't do very much work of the hands above the head, they're mostly kept down, and there's a different way of training the dancers. But in Russia, there's a second layer of the Russian technique, and that is in a school at, um, called the Mariinsky School in um, St. Petersburg. And there, a lady with the extraordinary down of a method, and it's generally thought that this is possibly the uh, the finest way of schooling uh, dancers, and they've fed into the Russian system, and many of the great dancers of our, our era have come out of that training school. In Italy, there have been a combination of France and Russia, if you like, and the directors have been either French or Russian influenced. And what we see now is a, is a distinctly French accent in this Giselle. A little more, uh, I, I guess, the, the, it might be said that the Russians is a very mus muscular style. Mm -hmm. The French style is very elegant and lean and beautifully linear. But the, the, the combo of those two styles is probably expressed best in the La Scala company. Mm, beautiful. Um, so, um, you had a beautiful story about um, Emma Livery, the, um, oh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and I thought people might enjoy to hear that story. Well, it, I've, I've written a piece for the program, and Emma Livery was a very, um, she was very young, very beautiful ballerina uh, with the Paris Opera Ballet, and she, she, she had a particularly light technique, of course, and she was adored by poets and painters, you know, the great writer Théophile Gautier, and many of the artists that existed in Paris in the middle of the 19th century, <coughs> from about 1850 onwards, were kind of in love with her, because she had such an ethereal and light quality. Anyhow, she was only very young, and her mother had been really... Uh, she was an illegitimate child of a, another dancer. And uh, her mother had begun teaching her, and. She had her own characteristic, if one reads all the reviews of her performance or the, the very lavish poetic descriptions of her lightness and ethereality, uh, she unfortunately was caught a, caught a light. You know, there were stage lights on the front and she wouldn't have her, her costume fireproofed. They, they knew that there was a danger when they went in those two old costumes for too close to lights that there was a good chance of going up in flames. And at that time, the, the fabric could be stiffened and fireproofed, but Livery wouldn't buy that. She wanted the lighter, finer thing. She skittled by at a rehearsal and went up in flames. She had a horrible, pretty horrible and long extended period of, of dying. But um, it's just a little romantic story about a romantic ballet. I mean, not too many of them go up in flames anymore, but no. there are a few operatic heroines who do, who have sticky ends. Yes, yes, your, your life generally. Uh, 
absolutely in your own hands. Um, there was a word in, uh, just while uh, Leo mentioned the programs, the programs are, as part of the student movement, um, the, the talk, the program, and you'll see the rehearsal tonight, which is a fantastic deal, and we'll talk about um, the student movement uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, but for those who aren't a student, you'll have to buy your program, and I'm not really trying to sell it to you, because, but it is truly a magnificent um, record of the visit of the company, and um, you know, students use it and take it to school and share it with your, uh, your friends, because it's a great uh, resource. Uh, there was a word in your essay that I didn't know, and I'm not from a dance background particularly, um, and I thought you might explain it to me, and the word was ballon. Oh, ballon is simply lightness. It's, it's a word that means you're, the lightness of the, of the dance. Yes. Yep. And, um, it, it, rather than clunky, I guess. It's, it's, right, yeah. and so uh, <laughs> can, you, can you talk about uh, this ballet as demonstrating romanticism? rather than classicism? Well, romanticism is, a, is, a, is a, a word for a compendium of styles. Uh, from, they're, quite, they're never quite distinct. They bleed one into the other, but in music you can often have, you have the move from, from early music to Baroque and then from Baroque into classical and from classical into romantic and romantic into, into what we do now. Uh, the, the, the romantic movement is very hard to completely pin down because it has been many expressions. Uh, there, are, there are painters who are said to have painted in the romantic mode. Uh, there are writers who've written in the romantic mode, and poetry in the romantic mode. But it, each of them has a kind of different take or a way of coming at romanticism. It may be uh, histori uh, historical subjects, it may well have something to do with, with uh, nature, with, with magic and, and with uh, some degrees of, of uh, extraordinary ghostliness. Uh, in the program, uh, I, there are some photographs, there's one uh, by a great German painter and who is the quintessential romantic painter of Germany and his name is, is Caspar David Friedrich. And he painted all manner of strange things, uh, a cross in the wilderness, or a, an empty, a sort of burnt out church in, in snow. Many of them don't have any figures in them, they just invite the, or if they have a figure, it's often just the back of a figure, but they and, and just, it's more about feeling, I think, than about uh, a kind of harsh reality. The, in the French painting, there were often big, dramatic canvases on historic subjects. And, and in ballet, the, the notion is always about ethereality. Mm -hmm. It's about lightness, ethereality, about strange spirits, uh, odd circumstances, dwarves, creepy people. A lot of that is worked into romance. There's also the literary romanticism in, in uh, novels like The Castle of Otranto, and that actually, um, and Byron was the ultimate romantic poet. Uh, and he, Keats. Uh, well, like, yes, yeah, subsequently, yeah, yes. Keats, yeah. Uh, but romanticism takes many forms, but essentially, I guess the markers are uh, spiritual, uh, a big celebration of nature always there, are lots of expressions of nature involved, and often exotic settings as well. Exoticism is, is also part of all of that uh, stew, if you like. It's like a very rich pudding with a whole lot of currants and raisins and plums and everything. And in the end, uh, they all merge into a big, lovely, easily definable movement that then swept into other, other sorts of things. It was quickly abandoned as old-fashioned by the end of the 19th century. Mm. Well, of course, we then came into the wars, didn't yeah. we? We started... Uh, but I guess the thing around uh, this ballet is um, that it epitomises romanticism, doesn't it? And well, I think it's, it, it's, it's a key expression in, in art uh, uh, of romanticism. There are other key expressions in painting and books and things yes. that, that act as markers. It's a bit like laying out a, a sort of maze with key ways that you can work your way through and then just get a general picture of what a maze is and how you get through it. And, and is it true that uh, Giselle was actually the first ballet to be on point? Yeah, well, it, it, um, what's her name? Uh, Taglioni was the first one. Uh, 
she, she was a, an Italian dancer, Mari Taglioni, and she was able to, um, to dance on point because up to that, the toe shoe hadn't really been invented. Dance had come out of the French courtly dance, which usually featured uh, a, a, a sort of godlike figure. Louis XIV really in introduced the ballet de cour, as it was called, the court ballet, in which he could perform as well, but they had very formal steps. Nobody, they had heeled shoes. You can still see good examples of it on YouTube in the recreation of some of the early Baroque operas uh, that were written by, by uh, Lully and by Rameau, where they do, the dancers are very formalized, little jumps and kicks, but nothing near athleticism at all, but it did in incorporate some of the figures. Then subsequently, most of the dancers up to Taglioni's time were dancing simply on, 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 their, on their balls of their feet, but she was able to get a shoe that, and, and get up. And all the figures of her, you will always see she's standing on her. But strangely enough, she ended her days running a dancing school in, um, in London, and Queen Mary, who was the grandmother of the present queen, actually had dancing lessons from Taglioni oh, when she was a young kid, learning about, but mainly dancing in the sense of, of how to comport yourself in a ballroom, but not at all on the stage. But it's just an interesting connection with, with uh, that extraordinary figure. She was, um, used to be called Tolus Taglioni. They used to say she cut all her toes off so that she could actually stand on just bones, but it was just a, a, a sort of myth. Her father uh, owned, yes, her fa owned a ballet yeah, company, yeah. didn't he? And her um, brother danced with her too. Right. Um, I want to take you, um, I'm, I'm not, not sure where we're going, but um, Umberto Eco, the very great Italian theorist and writer, um, wrote in, uh, uh, around um, life and times and periods like classicism and romanticism that very often when we look back over time with Baroque music and so forth, that the, the forms and the sound and the themes of those pieces actually depict the period as it is. Um, but this isn't really true of the period in which Giselle is set, is it? Because life wasn't diaphanous and ephemeral oh, and... Oh, of course not. No, no, no it, it, it's like a... It, um, Giselle is a Disney story, essentially, you know, uh, it, you, it, it's, it's a fairy story, and, uh, but it's given flesh and blood, uh, really, by the idea of li a live performance, uh, as opposed to something that's just a, a story in a book. It's a fairy tale, if you like, mm. but it, 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 it is brought to life on the stage, just as it might be in with Disney taking Cinderella and making an animated film of it, mm. or a film of it generally, mm. animated or not, yeah. Mm. Although it was common for women who um, had had emotional problems uh, to go mad, to, to go to the supernatural, wasn't it? Yes, I, uh, in a sense, I'm not quite sure that I, I'm not quite sure that I uh, have met any of those ladies who've got, <laughs> Who've gone crackers? Well, well, you know, uh, I'm in the I 19th. Think more balance these in the days. 19th century, they were locked up. Absolutely, That's the women thing. had a horrible life. Mostly, uh, mm. they were, they were. It was a m strongly male-dominated world, and they mm. were just there to, uh, you know, the, the, it persists with the saying in German, "Kusche uh, Kinder and Kirche." You know, women, kitchen, and church. They were the three roles that women were supposed to play, and, and uh, it's. It's unsurprising, of course, that the feminist movement has emerged with such force in our mm. time. Mm. High time, I say. And, and thank you. And uh, <laughs> some of the young women in the audience don't think it's changed far enough, I know. You speak to some of the millennium, millennials. Um, Leo, I wonder if we could, um, we're starting to draw to a close, I wonder if you could give us a couple of pointers about how to really settle in and get the most out of our experience when we're watching a ballet. That was performed in a wooden stage by daylight with no lighting effects and uh, it had a rowdy crowd boozing on the ground floor and a few toffs in the next level. Uh, and Henry um, Shakespeare, 
begins that play with a figure called a chorus, which kind of echoes the old Greek chorus that came in and told you what was going to happen and then you could watch it happen. That was the Brechtian effect in a way. And the, the chorus comes forward and invites the audience to uh, imagine everything. And he uses the phrase, on your imaginary forces work. Imagine this wooden O contains the vasty fields of France. And he evokes the idea in words of horses prancing and the Dauphin ready to confront Henry uh, the fourth, well, it was Henry the fifth, yes. Uh, and inviting all of that action to be imagined because they had no horse and they, had, they were on a wooden platform against a sort of neo-baroque background which was permanent and never changed. No lighting, no nothing, a few maybe primitive effects. And ultimately, any art that you experience is going to be an act of the imagination. You ha it has to evoke in you some form of emotion, uh, some form of criticism, some form of dissatisfaction, any kind of emotion. If it's just a blank thing that you look at and then go away, it's failed as a work of art. But every live performance has its own particularity, it has its own ability to reach out across footlights and through painted scenery and strange ladies called willies to touch your heart in some sort of way and, and, and leave you with a feeling of elation or disturbed, I don't know, many, many, many theatrical experiences, many art experiences are very confronting and very disturbing these days. But if it fails to evoke any kind of emotion in you, then it's, it's failed. Yeah. But the thing about this, I think very few of you will leave the theatre tonight uh, having not thought just how ravishingly beautiful the opening scenes of Giselle, the, the second act of Giselle is, because it is just one of those wonderfully evocative moments in the theatre, in any kind of theatre. Absolutely ditto to all of that and also say to people if there are parts that you are lost in just enjoy being lost you don't have to have all the in works of art just be gentle to yourself and just enjoy what you enjoy and look for meaning and be curious and ask yourself questions why did the choreographer decide to do that or what is, how is that furthering the narrative of the piece? And I think just trust yourself and, um, and just be open to whatever happens. Um, I, 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 sorry, I meant to read this. This is from your piece on page 51 of the program, and I thought this was a beautiful summation of romantic, the Romantic era, where you say, the Romantic era in dance was a time of fantasy, etherealism, supernaturalism and exoticism. The story ballet was born dealing with the issues of good versus evil, and that is the story of Giselle and the betrayal. Man versus evil. Um, that is as relevant at this very moment as it was when the ballet was first created. Yes. I would think so. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of supernatural, uh, the guy that invented the Marvel com comics, you he know, died, today. died. Mm. And he said an interesting thing. He, when he created the character of Spider Man, he was told by, the, by his editors that, oh, it would never, that, that title would never work. But he persisted. And he, he had to have a character that was troubled. And I saw a clip in the news, uh, on the news today, where he said every, every figure, every, every character has to have a degree of vulnerability. And that's been a constant view of mine, that you can't find your way into a work of art that is perfect. Mm. If I thought about singers, uh, the, Ella Fitzgerald was absolutely perfect, note perfect, 
everything perfect. But her perfection locked me out. Whereas singers like jazz singers like Billie Holiday, are, they're, they're, they're more vulnerable. They sound more vulnerable. Uh, as in my days of an opera fan, I was really, I've lived long enough to actually see Maria Callas live on stage. And her voice was really rough uh, and, and curdled at times, but she had such a force of character that you'd swap her for 25 Renee Flemings and 15 Joan Sutherlands, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. I mean, because she, she was just there. I mean, it was just that. She just went on and did what she could do with equipment that she was not brilliantly to have. And I hate the idea today there's this whole ironing out of performances. Everybody's got to look pretty. Joan, uh, Joan Crawford wasn't pretty. Bette Davis wasn't pretty. The Hollywood existed with a lot of extraordinarily plain people once, and we remembered them many more than a lot of the little fibber digibits today. I think. That idea of vulnerability uh, is, is a way we, c we can, we who are less talented than the people that are presenting their work to us, can, so, can feel a way in. And so for the younger people in the audience, the younger dancers, how do you develop as a performer, how do you develop that vulnerability? Well, I don't know. I think you're probably born with it. It's a kind of genius. Um, the... It's a combination of many things. Uh, an opera singer has to be incredibly good at dramatics. Uh, driving down from Mulaney today, I, I was listening to a CD in the car with somebody, uh, a CD of an Australian singer called Marjorie Lawrence. She came from, she was, she was a bit of a big star actually at the Metropolitan, the Paris Opera. And she was singing a bit from, from uh, from Valkura, uh, Wagner's opera. And she just gripped me, just, I, I'd never heard this particular recording because she was recording with, with the great uh, uh, um, Kirsten Flagstad as Brunhilde later in the opera, but this bit where she's singing with Wotan at the end of Valkura, she was fabulous and act, acting with the voice and coming out of a CD in a car on the Bruce Highway she had an impact on I mean, it. And that's what I mean about hearing something or seeing something that just actually strikes you and, and gives you a whole new perspective on yes. things. You can see it with the work of art. You can walk in and you, and you get a lot of wow factor from a, from a painting. You can get an awful you know, a whole lot of a ho hum factor too, but uh, from a lot of stuff that passes for art today, but we'll leave that question to one side. I'm talking about the performing arts and, and people who perform for you. And th the tools that they have may not be the best tools, they may not cut the best diamond. Uh, they, th what they can do, though, is, is add a humanistic ele or human element to, to their performance that suddenly gives you goosebumps. Yeah, and I think that's really nailed it. It's about their humanity, isn't it? Um, Leo, we're running out of time, and um, I, I think you'll agree with me, as Rebecca said, um, he is a walking encyclopedia. And before we finish, though, um, imagine if every child in Australia was able oh, to have the kind please. of immersion that Leo's had in his life. And it is happening in the world. And because this is a student movement, I want to tell you about the French government, who's just given every child in France uh, 500 francs. Euros. 500 euros to Cut. actually go and spend it on going to the theater, films, or buying books. For the students in the audience and for the voting public, let's do something like that in this country. Wouldn't that be extraordinary? And it wouldn't be just one Leo up on stage. You'd all have the capacity to do it. So would you please thank Leo? It's been oh, an absolutely wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. It, it, se it seemed like a short trip to a disturbed mind at times, but there you go. <laughs>